Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, Corinne, yes, thank you very much indeed for, for, for coming along. Great, great to have you here. So, we, we, we quite often have second generation racers here. Their, their father brings them into the sport, but I think you're possibly, that we know of anyway, the only third generation racer because your, your grandmother, I understood, raced in, it, in, in India. Uh, it's true. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, feel, I feel slightly intimidated, actually. This is a very, uh, <laughs> it's a very daunting audience. But um, listen, I, I, I was very fortunate. I grew up in a motor racing family. Um, you know, as you said, my dad used to race and rally. My grandfather used to race and rally. Um, but so did my grandmother, which when you think about the, the social context of an Indian woman in the 70s and all the sort of societal norms at the time, uh, it's pretty amazing, actually. Uh, you know, I, I grew up surrounded by three very powerful women, uh, my two grandmothers and my mum. And um, yeah, but I, I grew up in this environment around cars. And so, you know, we, we ran a race team and a rally team. So I, I grew up in the workshop and crawling around, you know, learning how to fix gearboxes and exhausts and things. But I was never pushed into it. Right. Um, you know, it wasn't a thing that I had to do. Uh, my, my parents, Certainly my dad never pushed me into it. For example, my brother had no interest in motor racing. He, he went on to play cricket and uh, you know, he's made a career uh, in, in sport, but completely showed no interest in motor racing until I started going to places like Monaco and Abu Dhabi when he suddenly, <laughs> suddenly sounded quite interested in rocking up. Uh, um, he wasn't one to show up at Snetterton, that's for sure. Well, we, we have a great photograph up there of uh, you, Karun, racing alongside uh, none other than uh, Michael Schumacher in, uh, in, in Formula One. Like racing alongside the loose stretch of the world. I think he's probably lapping me there. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take it. <laughs> but uh, to get to those sort of dizzy heights, obviously you have to start somewhere. So uh, here you are. What, 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 what is this car then back in India? Yeah, it's, it's, so I, I am I'm probably one of the last few drivers who would have got to race in Formula One having never done a go-kart race, you know, at, you know, the fun sort of charity events don't count, you know, in terms of actual karting. Uh, because I grew up at a time where we didn't have karting in India. We, we had no tracks, we had no championships, we had no races. So this uh, little single-seater um, and, and was the one we started with. It was a little 800cc, 800cc uh, Suzuki engine mm -hmm. um, with a road car gearbox. And um, we ran the car ourselves and honestly, it, it, I, I, because I grew up in that sort of workshop environment, I, I love the engineering side of sport. And I, so I would, you know, get, get out of the car, learn how to set up the flat patch, put the car on the patch, mm -hmm. and understand what caster did and what camber did and tow, and, you know, just very basic stuff. Mm -hmm. But it, it gave me a sense of appreciation, understanding of what, what a race car could do. Yeah, and all, all that basic setup stuff really essentially is the same all, 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 all the way through? Uh, I think it's, it's it, no, it's not, but I think you have to have an understanding of, of the core principles of race car. You know, once you, once you go into um, the world of aerodynamics, you know, that, there's a whole different um, ball game. But yeah, I, I did a bit of saloon car racing out in India as well. Um, you know, it's all, it was, you know, my dad's view was anything I could do. I was 16 years old at the time, uh, still in high school doing my A-levels and, um, you know, any, any racing and driving I could do was, was going to be a good experience. Mm -hmm. So you, you climbed the ladder in, uh, in Indian racing mm -hmm. and were, were, were obviously successful and as we, we knew where you got to, but was it, was it an, er, an early ambition? I mean, did you set your sights from, from an early age on really getting into professional racing? Yeah, my, my only memory is of wanting to be a racing driver. Uh, you know, I don't recall ever wanting to do or be anything else. Uh, I was very fortunate. I was able to carry on that journey, but I also had a family who were willing to back me to go through that journey. You know, again, in, in a country like India, A, saying you're going to have a career in sport is a massive shock to the system. B, saying you're going to have a career in sport in anything but cricket is an even bigger <laughs> shock to the system. Yeah. 326 for five today, by the way, India, if anyone's been watching. Yeah. 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 We're doing quite well in the test. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, my, my, the, my extended family thought my parents were completely barking mad when they took their second mortgage out and started selling off, you know, bits of land and things like that to, to fund a few more sets of tires for me to go racing. You know, we, we weren't a multimillionaire family. We, you know, we, we were comfortable um, in an Indian context, but 
uh, as soon, and, and there's lots of things that are different when you come, you know, to compete from outside of Europe. As, you know, Mark Weber and I often tell the story because, you know, he came from Australia. Uh, and I think there's a, there's, a, there's a hunger and a motivation to ch come through that ladder, uh, which is, and a stubbornness that you can't go back having failed. You know, you've sacrificed and left a life behind. But there's things that happen that, you, that people who grow up in a European country and, and in that home environment don't understand and appreciate. For example, I was trying to raise commercial sponsorship in India. So those sponsors on, on my race suit there, mm -hmm. uh, if you click the next picture as well, you see that you know, they were partners that I had uh, and they, they were commercial sponsors. Now, I had to learn, I was, this is 2004, but I came to this country when I was 18 years old um, on the 1st of February, 2002. Now, I was 18 years old. Most of my friends, you know, we did our A-levels. They were all off at university getting hammered in their, in their, in their dorm rooms. <laughs> and I'm having to go negotiate these multi six-figure sponsorship deals and explain to a head of marketing how I'm going to deliver an ROI on, on racing in a race up at Croft in the north of England. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, you're trying to explain to someone how, and, and you had to, right? You know, I would come back from the race, drive the three hours. Uh, I lived in Brackley in Northamptonshire at the time, go back home. I would write the press release at 10 o'clock at night to get to the Indian papers for the morning. And, you know, but you had to do those things mm -hmm. in my situation because that was the only way to raise money to keep going. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it obviously worked because you uh, kept climbing up the... Uh yeah, the, the motor racing ladder here, here in, in Europe. Was, it, was that? Was that was in GP2. That was Hock, Hockenheim, I think. Yeah, Hockenheim yeah. In, yeah. Um, in GP2, and I won the race there. Uh, it, it was a fantastic time racing in GP2. Um, you know, tough championship. Very. You arrive as a rookie. You get half an hour of free practice. Straight into qualifying, into two races. Uh, I think the most laps I ever did in free practice were nine laps in Monza. And then you got to go straight to qualifying. Uh, and this is the level just outside of F1, right? So, you know, you're, you're, you've got live TV, the eyes are on you um, of the F1 teams that you're trying to impress. I was a Red Bull junior driver, so I had to go see Helmut Marko uh, after every race, which is always an interesting, <laughs> interesting few minutes. Uh, um, but yeah, no, it, it, it was fantastic. You know, really, really enjoyable time. And uh, of course, you were you were competitive. Possibly, you're uh, the, the most competitive in the championship you've been. I think you won two GP2 races. Yeah, we had a bunch of podiums in the early, and and won some races in the early part of 2008. And then uh, from the midpoint onwards, uh, season I think we were fifth or fourth or fifth in championship. There were a bunch of us within a handful of points. And then I basically scored no points in the last eight races. We just had a variety of problems that car failures and in first lap incidents and things like that. So it somewhat derailed it. But um, no, on the whole, I, I had a good time. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you were a Red Bull junior driver there. Yep. Was, was there any prospect of getting on further up the Red Bull ladder? To be honest, you know, I, I think I'm one of the few drivers who left Red Bull on good terms, actually, in, at the end of 2008. <laughs> um, I, what, what about team managers? Well, I, 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 had, a co I had a coffee. I had a coffee with Helmut, in, uh, my dad and I went to see him in Valencia, uh, and he told me I was an old man, I was 23, and uh, he, he told me I was an old man, and uh, we were, you know, I need to start getting on with it, and all the rest of it. But um, I could see at that time there was a bit of a wave because um, of momentum behind other drivers. You know, they, you could see Vettel had just got to Toro Rosso, and he won that amazing race in Monza. Mm -hmm. The main team had um, DC who was about to retire, and, and Mark Webber was there. Um, you had Jaime Algasari and Sebastian Buemi who looked like they were sort of ahead of me in the queue. And it was hard for me to see a progression within the Red Bull system. So, you know, I, I, I ended up outside of Red Bull. Um, and at the time, there was a bit of support because the Indian Grand Prix was coming and, yeah. and things like that. So, um, and so I left with them in good terms. And actually, a, a rarity, when I signed to race with um, Hispania for 2010, I had an, an, um, like a brand ambassador deal back with Red Bull as a thing, you know. So uh, we, we left, we, we, we had, yeah, no issues at the so, end. So, th so this is you really achieving... Culmination the, of a dream, yeah. Achieving the dream, yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Here you are, a part of the, uh, the, the Formula One yeah. team. That must have been a, a, a great feeling to line up for that photograph. 
It, it was, you know, and you're, you're trying not to be overawed with it. Um, we had a whole lot of problems, you know, running in the run up to it. I, I didn't even drive the car at that point of taking the picture. Uh, we hadn't done a shakedown, hadn't done a test. The first lap I did was in qualifying. But, you know, the, the reality is, as a kid from India growing up, you seem, I, you know, racing in England, even in F3, seemed like it was on another planet. It didn't, it didn't seem achievable. The fact that I could be on that grid itself, um, I knew that my life would never be the same. You know, and then mm -hmm. it was wall to wall and on, in terms of the Indian newspapers and the media and a whole lot of people coming to the first race in Bahrain, which is obviously geographically close to India. Um, so, you know, it, that day you, you knew some, a, a big switch had gone. And I think that's the case for any racing driver. You know, you have your journey to F1, you have your journey in F1, however long or short that might be, and then it's what happens after that. Um, so for me, that uh, and the one thing that um, I always appreciate, but that, that was actually the Thursday before the race, so they do this um, sort of driver's picture. Um, and I rocked up in the paddock, and the first driver I met was Michael Schumacher. Uh, you know, I had, and I had a picture of Michael's Benetton on the wall in my bedroom. He was a, a childhood hero of mine, and um, uh, I, you know, I, I, and he, he was the first driver who came up to me and said, you know, welcome to F1, and we had a bit of a chat. I wanted to know where I come from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I always appreciated that. You know, he didn't need to do that. Uh -huh. uh, that was the day that he was returning to F1, and you know, he'd had his time at Ferrari gone away for three years, he was making his return with Mercedes. Yeah. He was the biggest star in the sport. You know, at that stage, he was bigger than Lewis, bigger than Fernando, bigger than anybody else. You know, he yeah. was a seven-time world champion uh -huh. coming back onto the grid, and I was a nobody. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I always appreciated that. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about the, the rest of the Formula One world? I mean, did you, did you feel welcomed uh, generally into it as, as, as well as Schumacher? Yeah, listen, I, I, I've been very lucky, um, you know, and I think it's, it's been a topic that's come up a lot in the last two or three years about whether or not I've ever felt um, unwelcome in, in a paddock or in the sport. Uh, people, you know, almost try and provoke me into a, an answer. Um, and I've always said the same thing, which is I, I think I've been fortunate. I'm not saying other people have been on the same journey. Um, I know people like Lewis have talked about issues they've had. but. I've never ever um, felt unwelcome in a race team or in a paddock and, or, or, or anywhere within the sport. And, mm -hmm. you know, my, my wife says it's because I've got buffalo hide and, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, <laughs> um, most of it goes over my head. But, uh, no, it's, it's it, you know, it was great. Uh, that was the British Grand Prix, it, which is obviously my fun, yeah. sort of adopted home race. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and again, you know, at that time, I, it, I remember it was very funny because that was the last race that ran at the old pits. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how many of you have been to where the old pits is versus the, the wing, of course. And I, I think a whole lot of atmosphere has disappeared since we moved to the wing. You used to have the fans right up there through, looking through the paddock fence. Um, and they were all shocked because I, my dad and I showed up in my 52 Reg Vauxhall Vectra that I had at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and they just could, there's this sort of diesel vector pulling up in the, and because, and even the security, because they had, you know, the driver's car park, there are 24 designated spots for the drivers. And, and, we, and I pulled up, and the security guy sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> had to do, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting conversation. But, <laughs> but, you know, it's a car I had when I was racing before, so I just kept it. Of course, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that, that season went through, on, on the whole, were you, were you, were you happy with it? Was that yeah, the year you missed the, missed the Indian Grand Prix, that, or was that the no, following year? No, that was the year after. No, year. I, yeah. listen, I, I had the opportunity to do um, the first half, uh, well, more than the first half of the season. And, and in my view, it was a case of either I could have gone and done GP2 again, um, or I could have been with the team in the back of an F1. And it meant from that day onwards, as I said, you were going to be an F1 driver and see what opportunities lay ahead. So f my view was... It was better to be in it than not. But the team came to me. It, it, you know what, that, that team actually, there's a lot of um, wasted opportunity in that team. You know, they, when I went to do the seat fit at Dallara in Italy, which is a, you know, I think Dallara as a, as a car manufacturer, you know, they do mass produce racing cars. Yeah, they build the Indy cars. Indy yeah, cars, yeah. Formula 2, Formula 3, all the rest of it. You know, they're a fantastic company. And they had very good people there at the time. Uh, and I remember going to do the seat fit, and they said to me, this was in uh, end of February, must have been. They said to me at the time, look, we ha we've run out of time. 
this is the car that sh was supposed to just go to the hotel in Murcia in Spain to do the launch. And this is, but unfortunately now, this is the spec we're going to have to take to the first four flyaway races. It's highly underdeveloped, but I, you know, I went to the wind tunnel and I spent uh, some time with the aero department there uh, and Mr. Delaro himself. And, and they showed me some of the stuff that, you know, that sh was supposed to be the actual race car. Mm -hmm. This was essentially meant to be the show car. Um, and there was 60 points of downforce. Now, you know, a rough guy, that, that would have been you pushing two seconds of performance. Uh -huh. um, and it, but it changed the whole lot of things, the way the tires work, the way the car works, all of it changes. And it would have put us into sort of Torosso territory. And if you look at what Delara did later on with Haas, okay, they had support for Ferrari, but they, you know, as a company, that's kind of where they were. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and we had great people in the team. You know, we had Jeff Willis, who had come from BAR and Williams and has gone on to Mercedes, uh, been, he's now working on the Ineos boat project. Um, he was our technical director. Um, my race engineer, Richard Connell, has gone on to Mercedes and with great success there. Mm -hmm. Um, Bruno Senna was my teammate, his race engineer, Chevy Pujola, he worked with Max Verstappen at Thor also afterwards. And, you know, um, the, the performance engineers, one guy now runs the simulator program at McLaren F1 and the other one uh, ran the Porsche LMP1 program. You know, we had such a great group of engineers. Yeah. And we were all in this mess together. Honestly, we was, it was chaos and it was, but all this chaos was happening above us in, in the sort of commercial financial department. And, and, and that's what I actually love about motor racing is the, um, I love sitting in an engineering room and going, you've done a free practice, you've got another one coming in two hours, you've basically got this little window of three or four hours in between to look at a problem, understand a problem, analyze it, think of a solution, try and implement a solution um, all in this small space in a very public arena. And I think that's why anyone who works in Formula One can go into what I call civilian life, working in a road car company or any engineering company, and, and absolutely thrive because the, the pressure to succeed in those time frames in F1 yeah. is unlike any other business, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, certainly good nursery ground for, for lots of people, engineers mm. included. So, uh, so the second year then... Mm. With, with Lotus. With, with, uh, with, with the Lotus then, so how, how did that go? It was actually the only time I fell out of love with motor racing. Um, I really, you know, I, I, was a, I was a reserve driver there. I had a contract to do a certain number of races, uh, including the Indian Grand Prix, and that's why I went there. Mm -hmm. I had the option to go to two or three other places as a reserve driver and do Friday practice sessions and sort of try and work my way back into a race seat. But I took the Lotus contract because they were guaranteed a certain number of races, and in the end, they, they broke that contract. So I didn't get to do the Indian Grand Prix. Didn't, you didn't do the Indian Grand Prix, um, I remember. You yeah. sort of hung around as this reserve driver, uh, and you just, you just feel like a spare part. Mm -hmm. And it's a horrible feeling, because as, as a reserve driver, essentially, you're there waiting for someone else to fall on their head, which is a pretty <laughs> bad existence, actually, mm -hmm. as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, and I just didn't enjoy it. And then, you know, when the contract got broken and stuff, I completely fell out of love with F1. Uh, and it's the only time in my life I thought, I didn't want to watch a race. I, didn't, I, had no, I just completely didn't want to know anything about Formula One. Mm -hmm. Did you, you're going to look at Le Mans in a second, but did, did you ever think about going to America, trying to, try, trying to look at IndyCar? I had, a, I had some conversations um, with some teams there. And again, no Indian driver had done the Indy 500, and actually still hasn't done the Indy 500. So there was, a, you know, there was an appeal for teams there. But a friend of mine, Mike Conway, had a, a big accident, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember talking about his legs after that. And I thought, it's just, it's not for me yeah. Uh, yeah. with the ovals. So I, I think it would have been interesting to do a road course program, but um, yeah, if you're going to do it, you have to commit, and you can't go with that mindset. I think. No, no, sure. So, as I mentioned, then you, I think you became the first Indian driver to uh, compete in the Le Mans 24 yep. Hours. Yeah, very special. Um, it was a friend of mine who, who we work together now at Sky. It was Anthony Davidson, uh -huh. um, and we. So in that 2011 year, I was mentioning with Lotus. You know, I, was, uh, I started doing a little bit of commentary with him and and David Croft, uh, doing Radio Five Live, and we were talking about bits and pieces. And Anthony said to me, "So look, you just got you got to close a chapter on F1, and." Um, come and do sports cars and you'll rediscover your love of, of motor racing. And I sort of, I mean, I, I honestly, I'd, I'd watched a bit of sports car racing um, when I was a kid, but 
it wasn't actually televised in India. It wasn't popular. So, you know, I sort of, I knew who Derek Bell was. And I knew the silk cut Jags and the Rothmans Porsches and things, but I didn't really know enough about it. Um, but anyway, I got deal to do this um, with the team JRM, with, a, with the Acura Honda um, program. And it, it was fantastic. You know, I had uh, David Brabham and Peter Dumbreck alongside me. And David, this was his 19th Le Mans, and wow. Peter's seventh or eighth wow. at the time. Yeah, you, you were uh, the rookie. And I was a rookie. And, you know, you sort of woke up, and it's all the small stuff. You don't know when to sleep, you don't know when to eat, you don't know what, you know, how to manage your energy for the week. Um, but also, you've got to find your own way. You know, it's, and I don't know if any of you uh, met David or know David. You know, he's got this sort of zen-like aura around him, and he, you know, he's, uh, he floats off in his own little world. Uh, but it was, it was a fascinating, fascinating experience. And again, coming back to it, being the um, first Indian to do the race was, was really special. There was, uh, I think, about 30 or 40 journalists mm -hmm. flew over from India to cover the race. Um, and I don't get particularly emotional in a race car because I, I don't think you can afford to. But there was a point in the, um, uh, I think, in, in that first day, you know, you, I sort of head out the pits and there's a campsite as you go through the Dunlop curves on the right-hand side where there was a whole load of Indian flags. Oh, and wow. it had been this miserable week where it rained. Weirdly, the, the race 24 hours was bone dry, but it had rained every single day for the, the preceding week. And there's a whole lot of Indian flags in this campsite. I thought, that's wow. pretty cool. These people have come, slept in the mud, and they basically come to, to see me. And that's a, that was a pretty amazing mm. moment, actually. F fantastic support, yeah. So think, is it, this is the following year, then? You went, went, yeah, went I, raced with this, uh, I raced with a team of mad Irishmen uh, called Murphy Prototypes. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, they, it, it, it was, we had, um, we had two reasonable years. I think we finished fifth and sixth. Um, and then we had one year but I got caught in a seven-car pile-up aquaplane down the Mulsanne Strait, which was, um, which was annoying. Um, <laughs> more a than annoying. A little, little bit scary, too, I would have thought. Yeah, but uh, it, that's Le Mans, you know. Um, you just you get this downpour, you run, and we were under the safety car, actually, but it's one of those things you get when you get a river of water underneath the car and you sort of, you're a sailboat, you've got no steering, no brakes, and you're just, you're sailing into another pile of cars waiting mm -hmm. for the bang. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, you know what, it's a, it's a magical race, absolutely wonderful race. I've been lucky to do it five times in my career. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. So move, moving on then, the next project then was uh, F Formula E. Mm. Yeah, this was an interesting one because I, um, I sort of played two different roles here. I, I negotiated the deal for Mahindra to get into the championship, so I effectively negotiated their franchise agreement with, with Formula E first, which was an interesting thing for me to do, to see another side of the sport. Um, you know, this was a complete start-up. You know, the first test, we all rocked up at Donington, and it was pouring with rain, and they only had one car per, per team. Uh, and in the end, you know, that was a time where we were sharing Two, two cars per driver, but at that time we just had one. And we all just stood there looking at each other going, we don't really want to drive this. Like, <laughs> you know, who knows what's going to happen? It's an all electric car, it's pouring in rain. Don't know, what, none of us knew, none of us knew what was going to happen. And you just have these horror stories running through your head. Um, and then we, I think we did a coin toss and Bruno Senna lost, so he had to go first. Um, <laughs> But in the event, it was fine. And, you know, cars stopped and all the rest of it, but as you'd imagine. Um, I, so yeah, so the, I spent a year working on getting Mahindra into the championship um, and, and then drove the first season. I found it a bit frustrating, if I'm honest. You know, you, you spent your entire time looking at the dashboard, watching the energy numbers and trying to manage the energy. Um, I, I think in hindsight, I perhaps, didn't also appreciate um, the, the scale of the challenge of it. You know, I think it, you know, at that stage, you, you've come out of, you know, I was only three years out of, two, three years out of F1, out of LMP1, and, and I was still racing in um, sports cars at the time, so I was still doing Le Mans, European Le Mans at the time. And you sort of go from that to something that, that is a lot slower, you uh -huh. know, in terms of speed and G-forces and, yeah. and cornering speeds with the groove tires and things. Um, 
And you sort of think, oh, it's a step back. Yeah. And, but actually, that was in hindsight, I reflect on that was actually the wrong attitude. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I go and do the television stuff with Formula E now, and I think I al always say to people, it's completely wrong to compare. And people within Formula E are guilty of it as well. They constantly compare it to Formula One, and that's completely the wrong thing to do. It's, it's an entirely different branch of the sport. Okay. In the same way that I believe sports car racing can coexist alongside F1, alongside IndyCar, alongside NASCAR, or touring cars, or GT racing, it's just another branch of the sport. It's a different type of racing, different way of going racing, mm -hmm. different technology. It, uh, it, it always seems to me to be very hard to overtake. The cars are always very, very bunched. If you're in a bunch and you're sixth or something, how, how, to, how to make up a place always seems very, very difficult. Yeah, you know, the thing that people <laughs> don't appreciate is actually the quality of the drivers is very high in that championship. You know, I think it's, a, it's probably the highest quality of drivers outside of F1. Mm -hmm. um, very, very good standard of drivers. Good standard of teams and engineers. A lot of ex F1 and LMP1 sports car engineers running the cars. Um, they've all got the same batteries, same aero, same tires, right? So the, the differentiator is, is the motor uh, and the software to optimize what you've got. And there's small differences. Um, so so they, you, therefore, you get this bunch back mm -hmm. racing. You know, I think there was two seasons ago, there were 14 drivers with a mathematical chance of winning the championship going to the final weekend. That's a little bit different to Formula One then. We'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just said not to compare. <laughs> You're true. <laughs> I'm falling into the same trap, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I think that was, that was more or less it was as far as your sort of frontline ra racing yeah. was concerned, the, the, the Formula E, and we were just talking about it over, over, over dinner, that uh, you, you then, like, like many uh, drivers, a well-trodden path, you then kind of made, made a transition into historic racing, yeah. particularly Goodwood. I'm glad you found a picture before the engine grenaded itself yeah. <laughs> in a spectacular ball of fame. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no, I, I, I love going to the revival. Um, it's a weekend my wife looks forward to more than I do. I think the, you know, the fact that it's a a proper walk back into time. Um, you know, what Charles March has done with those three events is just extraordinary. You know, he, he's, he's such a visionary in terms mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what the, you know, the, from what I understand, the estate was on its knees and he's managed to turn this into an amazing, real mecca for people to come to. Um, and I like, I, I like going back and driving. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate I get invited to drive all sorts of bits and pieces and um, experience. You know, I think we... We're very fortunate in our sport, we have a rich history, and I think a lot of drivers underappreciate that and, and don't recognize that, and they sort of, you know, you l they, they look at someone like Richard Atwood walking around and go, what does this doddering old man know, what does he know about what I do? And actually, you know, it, it, when you go back and drive um, these cars uh, around Goodwood, you, mm. you get a real appreciation for Drivers of the past. And well, he, he's amazing. I mean, he's still w very competitive in his 70s. Yeah, yeah. I've now, in the last three or four years, I've become a sort of taxi driver. I have to take him to the dinner every. He, sort of sta <laughs> he stands there and goes, Oh, there you are. And, <laughs> yes, Richard, in the back seat. I get the kid seat out of the way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's. Um, no, I love it. I drove, this was an, uh, the M1A McLaren that I drove. Utterly terrifying. Um, I drove it twice, 2018 and 2019. Um, actually, if you go to the next picture, you'll see, you can see the fuel coming off the, 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 the vapes coming off the top. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it was an experience. We were on the, so the owner of this particular car uh, insisted that they had the original ratios in it. I think, he, I think he made fresh gears, but two of the same ratios as when he bought it in period. Uh, and we were on the rev limiter on top, which he worked out was 172 mile an hour. That's frightening. Um, it, was, it was mildly terrifying. Um, <laughs> I, I, I won the race in 2019, and he, he sold the car straight after that because the value had gone up and stuff. And oh. I was slightly relieved, if I'm honest. Because <laughs> it's one of those things where you, you know, it's very hard to say no to, right? Because it's mm. a fantastic experience. Um, but... I think in it was 2018, the first year I drove it, we were in the, um, you might be familiar with Google, they have sort of collection area before you drive up onto the track. And I was in the car, strapped in, and this marshal came up to my wife, who was six months pregnant at the time with our first son. And the marshal came up to my wife and said, did you know this car's known as the Widowmaker? And I was like, oh, God, <laughs> it's not really helpful. <laughs> 
And I'm sort of giving it the, you know. And uh. then he, he, he sort of carried on digging. He said, yeah, Bruce McLaren died in something similar just over there. And I was like, oh, God, just. Like I was like, I'm off, dear. See you in a half an hour. <laughs> anyway, that was not helpful. But um, that was fantastic. You know, just a, a great experience. Did, did, did you ever drive it in the wet? I mean, pretty scary in the drive. I, in the uh, wet? You know what? I drove it at Donington. We went to, they rebuilt the car. And I went to shake it down at Donington. I drove five laps and I said to the owner, it runs, it changes gear, everything works, have the keys, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going home. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah. yeah. Always seems to rain when you go to Donington. Well, it does a bit. Yeah, so you, you, uh, you do lots of uh, testing and uh, you know, we, we saw you driving the, um, the, the Williams there in the little yep. film, but I'm um, gonna run, run through a collection of some of the cars that you've, uh, I mean, yep. To say that you've driven some interesting cars in your career, Corinne, is, uh, is an understatement. So what, what about the, the Gold Leaf Lotus? Yeah, I've driven um, 30 different Formula One cars now, including 12 which have won the World Championship. Um, so, you know, driving a car from every decade since uh, the Aston Martin from 1937 uh, until the 2019 Mercedes is the most recent one I've driven. And it's great. You get to see the evolution of the sport. You get to see... Um, and appreciate just how the sport has changed. And uh, in, in my, you know, people often ask me which era would have liked to race in. And I think the, the early 90s is, right. um, late 80s, early 90s, you know, 1989, 1990. Weren't, weren't the cars quite dangerous and you sat very far forward in the cars in, in that era? No, I think by that stage, you know, the, the, the regulation had come in where the, the legs had to come behind the, the back, yeah, front yeah. center lines of the, of the front axle. I think that was a big change for driver safety, really. You know, yeah. you look at people like Lafitte and Martin Brundle and stuff, you know, they're all, they've all got, they're all limping around because of racing the early 80s and the yeah. front accidents. Um, but for me, that era of the late 80s, early 90s, you know, the cars had power, aerodynamics was really ramping up, um, you know, those those amazing McLaren Hondas versus the William Renaults and the Ferraris. Um, you know, that, that's the era that I absolutely loved. I drove the Jordan 191. Um, we'll come on top. What, what's, what's the, what's so the history of So this was uh, the Lotus 49B, which, um, you know, arguably the most important car in, in F1 history. You think, you know, Chapman, um, I've just finished rereading the, uh, the Chapman, uh, one of the biographies, Michael Lawrence book actually, and, you, you realize just what a mad genius he was. Um, and, you know, I don't know if I would have wanted to drive for him or work with him. He sounded quite yeah, yeah. tough. A bit cantankerous. Um, yeah. But, you know, Jim, Jim, Jim Clark is my, if anyone asked me who's your, who would you put as the all-time greatest driver, I'd always say Jim Clark, I think. Um, uh, and so for me to get a chance to drive that, uh, I asked, I've been sort of gently nudging Clive Chapman at Classic Team Lotus uh -huh. to um, let me have a go in a, in a 49 or a 49B. And this was at Monza. Um, uh -huh. I got a chance to drive it around there, which was, which was amazing. You know, you're going around the Curva Grande, and this was on Grand Prix. We, I drove it on the Saturday and the Sunday. And you think, you know, the crowd are there for the Italian Grand Prix, and you're driving around. Um, and I was following Emerson Fittipaldi around, and he was in his championship winning 72. Wow. Uh, it was just one of those surreal, surreal moments. Well, and that sounds fantastic. Well, another another car which uh, drivers of the period certainly always said they found pretty scary was uh, was was this one. Horrendously uncomfortable. Uh -huh. I couldn't. I, I have no. I actually got out of it and went to find Mr. Atwood and find out how on earth he drove it for 24 hours. Oh, yeah. Well, well, not, well, not, not him, but the team. Yeah. Uh, and he just sort of went. Well, I just did. And he just sort of shrugged and wandered <laughs> off. <laughs> um, could not believe how uncomfortable it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, this particular car is the car. That is the first Porsche winning. That is actually the winning chassis. Oh. Mm. Um, that's privately owned now, but it is, it is the actual winning chassis from the first ever Porsche victory at Le Mans. Mm -hmm. So do you do the, the Festival of Speed most that was years the as well? Festival of Speed, yeah. Do you do that most years then, the Festival of Speed? I haven't seen it. It all depends on the calendar. Yeah. Um, I, I enjoy going to all of it. I enjoy, I enjoy the members meeting and, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a bit less chaotic, mm -hmm. less crowd and things, but yeah. And we, we were sticking with Goodwood over dinner, we were talking about you driving the, uh, the Nick Swift minis. We don't, I don't think we yeah. photographed for that, but uh, that, that looks like a lot of fun. 
It is, it is a lot of fun. Um, you know, I had a great little dice with Jason Plato. I remember the first time I went to Goodwood, uh, we were in two little minis and just, and it is, you know, I think, but that's, that's the beauty of it, right? I think in um, that, that year, 2019, I raced the mini, um, I raced a Ford Galaxy and that McLaren Can-Am car on the same day, <laughs> it's, you know. But it's really, it, really winding the clock back, isn't it, to how, how it yeah, used to be? Yeah, but that's how it used to be, right? Yeah, and the, yeah, you'd you'd yeah. talk to people like Jackie, and you know, they, they would hop in and out of all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not that, that big a range, but you know, they mm -hmm. would certainly jump in and out of different cars. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the next two cars are um, absolutely amazing. Um, a, a James Hunt McLaren and, yeah. a, and a Nicky Lauda Ferrari. Wow, I mean, does, does, it, does it get any better? Absolutely incredible. How, was this the same day or? or, or yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, uh, Martin Brundle and I went up to Snetterton and drove these two cars uh, in a bit of a Hunt versus Lauda, sort of, not versus, but Hunt and Lauda story. Uh, and we drove, we drove cars and swapped around and swapped stories. It, it was fantastic. But you also realize how dangerous that era was and why the cars ignited so quickly. Um, right. You know, I remember sitting in the Ferrari that took all the bodywork off and they just, the, the, the fuel, you're just surrounded by fuel. You're just sitting with just, you know, these, um, and I guess, you know, the, they perhaps didn't have the technology in terms of fuel baffles and the slush and things like that at the time. So they had these sort of mini tanks. It was divided up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and it, you just, and then you understand why you know, accidents like Roger Williamson and things like that happen. It's and of course, Lauda had his big Nürburgring accident in, yeah. a, in a car similar to that. Yeah, I think this was the 74 car. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So obviously that was a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So which was the best then? Uh, the, f the, the, the Ferrari, the sound of the Ferrari was amazing. Uh, the McLaren was, was a slightly newer car. It looks like an M26, it, it, it I think. It's amazing, but actually yeah, it summed yeah. up kind of that era, which is Ferraris had amazing engines, but didn't handle as well as as the other cars. Um, and actually, if you read Lauda's book, that's what he often talked about in the 70s. You know, the, 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 that was the sort of, um, yeah, just the, the characteristics of the Ferraris versus their competitors. Sure, and uh, another Lotus outing then at, yep. uh, at the Lotus at, 79. At good, Lotus 79, another revolutionary car from uh, Chapman. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's got to be in most people's top five most beautiful cars, I think, in, in F1 history, really, the 79 of the ground effects. Um, so, yeah, another big box to take off the bucket list. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, m m many years ago, I, I, I worked for Eddie Jordan, so I'm... Oh, God, how unfortunate. Uh. <laughs> well, it, well, there's a story about that, actually, because uh, Lorraine and I bumped into Eddie Jordan at Silverstone, and um, uh, this was years later, and uh, he didn't remember me. And um, L Lorraine went up to, to Eddie and said, uh, you know, realize Harry used to work for you, and he said, that's nothing to be proud of. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he, um, so I don't know. I don't. I don't know if you. Uh, how many of you are aware? He's, he does his podcast now with with DC, and I, I get a, I get a phone call from EJ, you know, every every few weeks or so, and it, it generally starts with, in the same way, which is, now, you know, I wouldn't be calling you if I didn't need something, <laughs> and it'll be I'm interviewing so and so. I don't remember anything about what happened in their career and sort of give me five bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> and then you start, you start talking to him and he's telling stories of, you know, his interaction with this particular driver who was driven for his team. And you're going, Eddie, Eddie, that didn't happen. None of this happened. <laughs> <laughs> and you listen back to the podcast and it's, you know, all, it's like there's a, there's a version of history and there's an Eddie version of history. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But you know what, I, he, he is just this lovable rogue. You know, I, I, I absolutely, I, I love Eddie. Absolutely love Eddie. Yeah, he's he's well, we, such a great character, and um, the world's a better place for him. Oh, he is. Well, he, he, he did. His, does he ever talk I, to you about? I his never want to drive for him or do business with him. No, just no. Like, you know. Well, Morris Hamilton is his ghostwriter, yeah. and uh, Ma Morris basically wrote his, his biography. Yeah, but if you talk to Eddie, he thinks he wrote every word of it himself. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, le I, I, wrote, I wrote this at the British Grand Prix when I was working at Channel 4. I wrote this script for him to go do whatever this piece he was doing because he, he rocked up late, didn't know, he, he literally rocked up as the camera's about to go. And I went, here's the script, I've written it for you, just go say these words on camera. And he went off and he, he did this thing. And there was one line that he changed. 
And that was the line that managed to upset everybody Oof. because it was not, <laughs> not right. And anyway, he came back. Um, so they broadcast the piece what, a, a day or two later. And he comes back and says, he w walked into the office and goes, do you know that piece I did? Everyone said it was the best thing this weekend. I was like, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you telling me? <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's him. Yeah. So yeah, no, another another iconic car, and uh, yeah, you, you were telling us uh, earlier on about your interaction with uh, Sh Schumacher Senior, and uh, I told um, Mick that story actually uh, on the day, uh, and uh, uh, saying uh, how much I appreciate his dad. But he, he, you know, a lovely guy. It, it was quite amazing actually, because he. So this was the, the Jordan that Michael obviously made his debut in at Spa, uh -huh. and um, we we went to Silverstone and arrange for Mick to, so I was going to do a few laps and then Mick was going to do a few laps and we sort of had this day. And he got in it and, you know, I was, talk, so I was going, you know, talking to it and saying, oh, you know, when you get to, you sort of do the heel and toe and this and he looked at me and went, what's heel and toe? <laughs> and sort of, well, you know, there's a, and he said, and he started going through the gears and I realized he'd never driven a race car which was a manual gearbox. Mm -hmm. when he, ever since he started in F4, they were paddle shift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so we had this bizarre, bizarre moment. We had to put the car on the jacks and sort of, I had to teach him how to heel and toe <laughs> in, <Amazing>. in the <laughs> garage. Um, yeah, but a, an amazing Nothing. car. Uh, and actually, we, we managed to create a nice little reunion because we had Gary Anderson. Yes, I, I saw it actually. Chief, I, I think he was yeah. the chief designer or yeah. technical director at the time. It um, comes from the same town as me, actually, Gary Anderson. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, Trevor Foster was there who yeah. engineered Michael. Um, Andy Stevenson was the, was the number one mechanic. Uh, and Ian Phillips, who was EJ's right-hand man, yeah. Uh, yeah. commercial yeah. director. So it, it was a great reunion to yeah. get them all to come and share stories of how Michael ended up there. I've only ever seen him interviewed a few times, but I must say, Mick does come across as a, a really nice guy. No, he's a, listen, he's got all the ups, uh, sorry, he's got all the downsides of the surname, with the pressure and the expectation that comes, with none of the upsides of having his dad there mm -hmm. alongside him. As you know, Michael would have been the world's best driver, coach, mm -hmm. uh, and manager, and you know, the, it, it's for what they're going through personally, mm. um, it Terrible. must be extraordinarily difficult to, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to have to go on that journey without, without having his dad alongside him. Yeah, terrible. So mo moving forward a couple of eras. So you must be the only person who's driven a current Mercedes, and a, well, I don't mean current, current, but I mean you're r roughly re recent Red Bull and recent uh, m m Mercedes as well. Probably. Uh, yeah, I guess. I, don't, I haven't really thought about it, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possibly. Uh, yeah, this was my first F1 test, 2007, but I drove the 2011 championship winning car um, at Paul Ricard on a, on a filming day more recently. But um, yeah, amazing, you know. But I think, if you skip the next picture, the, the 2019 car, it is by far the best race car uh, I've driven by a country mile. Mm -hmm. But I think it's almost too perfect. It, you know, you watch the onboards today, and it's taken some of the emotion out of it, I think. Um, in, in my personal view, F1, the peak of Formula One was actually 2004, because you had cars that were the big V10 engines, you had a tire war, mm -hmm. they were only 605 kilos, as opposed to, you know, this year we're going to be up to nearly 800, and they start the race at 900 kilos, which is basically an LMP1 car. Um, from 10 years ago. Um, they're too heavy, they're too big, um, you, they feel lethargic, they're too, you know, they just don't feel, it doesn't feel like an awe-inspiring experience, and I think that's what Formula One should be. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I drove Juan Pablo Montoya's 2004 Williams BMW, which won the Brazilian Grand Prix, the last race of 2004. I drove it at Silverstone, and every time I turned the steering wheel, I thought this thing was gonna kill me. You know, yeah. it's just like, what on earth is happening? It's just attacking your senses. You're so getting thrown around, and it's just, it, it was terrifying. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's what it should be. It should be like that. That's you know, what and, and then, say, then yeah. you get the differences. Then a, a Lewis Hamilton or a Max Verstappen or a Fernando Alonso is not going to be two or three tenths over someone who's less good. Then you'll get to see six, seven tenths. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think in some ways we've got this sort of benign... Formula One now, um, the cars are just, I, I think the biggest thing is the weight, and 
I I've been criticized. I've been taken to the headmaster's office for criticizing it publicly. Uh, but I personally think hybrids are, are wrong in F1. That's, mm. it's, it's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you know, we've gone to these big cars with the hybrid systems, and I think this is where there's a bit of um, this, the sport is slightly dysfunctional. You know, you sh the FIA should be able to say, you've got Formula E, which is doing electric. You've got Le Mans and the World, World Endurance Championship doing hybrids, and there's a whole variety of different hybrid configurations. And let Formula One go back to being normally aspirated. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could go V8s, V10s. I, th I think noise. most people... This um, but, but, crucially, but crucially, it should be on sustainable fuels. And, and um, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know... How, you know, I, I'm not someone who can pretend to know enough about um, sustainable fuels. You know, someone like Paddy Lowe might be able to tell you more. But personally, I think that's what F1 should be looking at. You know, I'm slightly digressing here, but, but it's a, you take another step back. It's kind of the, world, the, the way the world's gone, right? You've got all these people in parliaments, not just in the UK, but all around the world, declaring these 2030, 2035, 2040, we should all be electric. I, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that the governments are dictating what should be produced, because I think that mm -hmm. then um, it has a negative effect on, on engineering creativity. Mm -hmm. What they mm -hmm. should be saying is, these are the metrics we want to achieve yep. in terms of um, eco-friendliness. Now, that can be emission numbers, that can be but by whatever metric, right? You want to say in urban areas, this is our target. Now, off you go, automotive industry with your billions. You go off and research. The Japanese companies will go down the path of hydrogen, perhaps even more, as they have done. You'll have others going sustainable fuel. You'll have some doing electric. But at least you've got engineers thinking all sorts of different ways. Instead, they, they've sort of gone the reverse way and saying, you must all think of this uh -huh. and spend 20 billion building these battery companies. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's kind of, you look at what was happening in F1. I don't know how many of you are aware, for 2026, we've got the, the engine rules coming in. Um, which they're talking about a 50-50 split of hybrid and um, uh, sorry, electric and ICE power. Um, but that's created a whole load of issues in terms of the chassis. You know, they've now, there's this arguments going on about how to make the cars less draggy, and all of a sudden you've got the engine rules dictating the chassis rules, which seems the other way around, but they've had to do that to entice some manufacturers back in. Mm -hmm. so you, you, we've gone into this this sort of circle um, which, which feels like how the, the wider world is thinking. That, that's why I drew the parallel. So I, I just feel like the sport needs to, needs to sort its identity out mm -hmm. uh, well. and decide what it wants to do and be. Because F1 shouldn't be the follower. We shouldn't be following what the road car industry does. I get there's commercial reasons why you know, manufacturers feel they have to have certain things to be a part of it. But manufacturers will come and go. Mm -hmm. And they have done in the history of the sport. And I think F1 should be the leader of innovation uh, rather than the follower. Well, I'm sure you're, you're preaching to the converted here about a, a return to V10, V10 engines and uh, the, uh, the, the, the noise. It's not sure. going to happen, but, you know, no, I can dream. It's a dream, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, let, let, so let, let, let's move on. Let, let's look at some yep. of the other things you've done. So uh, uh, ple pleased to see you got behind the, the wheel of a, a rally car occasionally. Well, how, that how was... Um, yeah, it was... Uh, it was a Colin McRae Subaru, but the, in the passenger seat, you can sort of see, yeah, you can see her head there. That's Holly McRae, Colin's daughter. Oh, wow. Uh, and I got to take her for a passenger ride. It was, again, one of these surreal things. I followed Jimmy McRae and mm -hmm. Alistair, Colin's brother, uh, and I had Holly alongside me and at the festival of speed, and we all drove up the hill. Uh, yeah, amazing. Just to, just to experience, again, something different. Mm -hmm. So you, you fancy doing a bit of rallying at all? Well, my dad used to. I, I, I quite like to do, I, I probably will do something in India for a bit of fun, mm -hmm. just, just to experience it and see what it's like. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we, we saw you um, earlier on in the, in the video, uh, and one of your roles now is working with uh, the Williams Heritage mm. fleet. So do you want to tell, tell us how, how that all came about? Well, Jonathan Williams is a, is a very good friend of mine. Uh, he was that's, a that, That's Frank's son? Frank's son, sorry, Frank's eldest son. So he was a co-owner of iSport the GP2 team I raced, and uh, Johnny and I have gone on to become very good friends. And, um, you know, the, around, sort of in the, around 2014, 15, we, we got talking about, you know, we got this amazing collection of cars. What do we do with it? And um, 
sort of got Heritage up and running, and it's about building cars, selling them to private clients, running them ourselves, cars owned by Williams, showing them off. Um, so I, for example, clients who buy the cars, I go and coach them in a, you know, I go to a circuit in the UK with some Formula 3 cars, coach them along in an F3 car, give them a bit of a taster, get them going in a single seater, and then we go to straight line days, and then eventually get, get them on track. We go to pick a track somewhere safe, like, you know, Jerez or Barcelona, something like that, and um, get a chance for them to drive their cars. So mm -hmm. I sort of mm -hmm. handhold that process, but along the way, you know, so I go to these days, um, these were pictures from Jerez where, so I go down and shake the cars down and set them up and just, you know, just make sure they're in, in the ballpark, you know, especially with the active car and stuff, you, wanna, you need to make sure you, um, you know, the cars are, are right before you put, put an in inexperienced driver into it. Uh, uh, make absolutely, sure that yeah. The systems are all working fine. And so, yeah, we saw you earlier in Nigel Mansell's car because you yeah. also drove the, 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 the Damon Hill. Damon's a, a, a president here, the, the, the Brooklyn's member, so we've... Uh... Yeah, which, um, you know, I drove... I mean, Damon's car, uh, the, the, the 93 car, you know, they, they were competing against McLaren that year, I think, for being the, the most technologically advanced car. I think in, in hindsight, you'd say the McLaren chassis and the, and the active was probably better uh, than the Williams by the time they got to 93, but they had the power advantage. But certainly, this, this car we're looking at, Nigel's 92 car, was miles ahead of everybody else. Mm -hmm. So not, not just about the cars, but the personalities as well. Um, you, you look not sort of completely comfortable there sitting chatting to, um, <laughs> chatting to Mr. E. How, how did that go? Um, he, you know, I, 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 I've been lucky. You know, Bernie's been a friend uh, and a great supporter for many years. So I first met him in 2008, uh, 2002, when I was racing F3. So I was 18 years old, and he wanted to get in um, F1 on TV in India, uh, on terrestrial TV, and he, they couldn't get it done. So he met my dad through some work they were doing, through Vijay Malia, who used to own Force India. Oh, yeah. So they were, he was a common friend. Vijay introduced Bernie to my dad and said, look, just see if you can help out. Because uh, my dad was working with the Indian Federation. And um, so anyway, we helped get it on, get it sorted. But when my dad came to England, he, um, Bernie said, well, why don't you come down for lunch? So, you know, here I am in F3, you know, 18 years old, I dusted off the one suit I owned and sort of <laughs> go down to Bernie's office and there's a little conference room and my dad and I are sitting there and he's just sort of waiting and there's a very imposing statue of himself sort of leaning <laughs> on the table. Oh, God. Uh, and he, um, so you sit there and you wait sort of five minutes, and he, he, he stomps, on, stomps into the room, and I like, sort of go like, oh, hello, nice, nice to meet you, and he goes, you hungry? Yes. And we go up, and we come out of the thing, and there's, there's you know, cars and nice cars parked outside, and I think, oh, we'll just get, get in the car, go. And he's on his heels, and he's off down the pavement, and you're sort of following him along, and my dad and I look at each other, wondering what on earth we're doing, and chasing him down the pavement. And he's chatting with the builders and the scaffolders and on the scaffolding and sort of... And we get to the, this dead end and there's a, literally a hole in the wall. And he hops through this hole in the wall. Like, what on earth is going on? <laughs> and we walked into this pub and sat down. And uh, the pub went deadly silent. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> it, it, genuinely, if you had to draw an equation of smallest man versus biggest presence, he wins hands down. <laughs> um, the pub went silent and we walked in. And I, w I was a vegetarian at the time, and I sat down, the, the waitress came over, what were you like? And I just sort of froze, and he went, what do you want? <laughs> uh, and the, she suggested a rocket salad or something. I hated rocket, and honestly, I couldn't eat rocket for a decade after that, and I just <laughs> ordered it, it was disgusting. But, um, but actually, over the course of that lunch, you realize deep down he loves motor racing. Mm -hmm. I think that's what people forget. Yes, he loves making money, yes, he loves the deals and all the rest of it, but he loves, he loved motor racing. Mm -hmm. And we just sat there and he wanted to know about my dreams and my aspirations and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we, you know, we kept in touch over the years. And when the Indi when, you know, he, he, he was, a, he was, he was a visionary, you know? I think he, he was able to look ahead of his time and see, obviously with what he did with TV and things like that, he was an absolute visionary in terms of mm -hmm. sport. Um, but then he, he asked us to help him because they were getting loads of inquiries from different people around India saying, 
we want to build a track and host the Indian Grand Prix. And most of them are time wasters. So he kind of used us as the first round of filtering. And then he would come out and we'd do a little, we'd set up meetings with people with those series. And that was a fascinating experience, you know, traveling around the country, going in these meetings, spending, watching how he dealt and operated with people and, and, and dealt um, with negotiations was, was, was a really, you know, for me as a person in their early 20s at the time, this was 2006, so I would have been 22 years old, mm -hmm. to, to be, you know, spending a week in his company and going to all these meetings was an amazing education. Actually. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and then when the Grand Prix came through, we, we ran the operations. And uh, it was a tricky time because on one hand, we were, you know, working with Bernie and sort of being his eyes and ears, but on the flip side, we were consultants to the promoters in India. So you sort of occasionally left hand negotiating versus the right hand yeah. and things like that. Um, you know, D Crofty and the, the, the most of the commentators still haven't forgiven me because we were standing on the straight one day on Staff Finish Straight during construction and when we don't have enough hospitality boxes for the, um, for the, 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 the VIPs, the sponsors. sponsors. And, yeah. and uh, Bernie's right hand man, Pasquale, was out there and uh, it must be the early days of, of FaceTime. And we sort of did, I can't remember, I don't think it was in FaceTime. We did, because Bernie wouldn't have had FaceTime. Anyway, it was some form of video call. And we did from standing on the grid. And he went, what are those? Up, you know, sort of, Pascal, I point, look, show me the glass. What, what are those? And he went, oh, those are the commentary boxes. He went, no, they're not. They're the hospitality. <laughs> and so I, right, what do we do with the commentators? Don't know, put them in a bunker. <laughs> and basically, they ended up, it was, to date, the only place on the planet where they've had to accommodate in a windowless room <laughs> behind the kitchen <laughs> in the media center. Um, so yeah, that was funny. So you, you've obviously met a lot of, lot of great drivers. Um, F F Fernando Al Al Alonso here, obviously still, still, still going strong. Um, yeah. Nicky Lauda, were you, were you close to Nicky Lauda as well? No, I wouldn't say I was close. I, 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 I met with him and spoke with him a few times and you know, um, he was everything you would imagine. No nonsense, straight to the point. Mm -hmm. You asked a question, he told you a truthful, straight answer, no sugar coating. Um, which when at that time I was working with Channel 4 was brilliant. Yeah. Because you'd, you'd see the communications department trying to manage the message. And you just get Nikki say, oh, this is bullshit! <laughs> 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 Uh, which was great. Yeah, yeah, he certainly, he certainly acquired that reputation in his, in his la latter days, didn't he? Yeah, was, kind, of, kind of missed, I guess, really, Nicky Lauda around the, the, the Formula One scene. Yeah, absolutely, you know, absolutely. And, and um, again, you know, you read his book, To, to Hell and Back, I think mm, it's called. Yeah. Um, listen, the fact that he drove, and it's sort of forgotten, right, in all these great comeback stories we get, but. The fact he drove at Monza 42 days mm. after his accident when the priest led him the last rites mm -hmm. will and should still, I think, in so many ways remain the greatest comeback in sporting oh, history. Yeah. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. So the uh, Alan Prost, of yeah. course, another... Um... It, it, was my, uh, it was actually my childhood hero. Uh, I, I grew up as a, as a Prost fan, which is kind of how I became a Schumacher fan, because if you were a Prost fan, by default, you had to hate Senna and then Prost retired, so you had to become a Schumacher fan and all the rest of it. <laughs> and, and the irony in all of this is, is that I became teammates with Bruno Senna, Ayrton's nephew, nephew yeah. um, in three different categories, and he's one of my best friends. <laughs> so, and I, I become very close with, you know, his mum, who's Ayrton's sister, and his sister, you know, the whole Senna family. Um, and right from the start, I said, you know, you do know I was a massive Prost fan. We had this sort of thing going on, uh, which is all quite good fun. So you then obviously went down the, uh, the, t the, the TV route yep. with uh, Crofty and uh, Martin Brundle. And um, yeah, we were talking over dinner. You, you do about, about half or so of the, the Grand Prix? A bit more, no, two thirds. Two thirds. Yeah, I, I think, um, so I, I started commentating. My first commentary uh, job I did was in 2004. I did the Chinese Grand Prix for uh, Star Sports, which is the Asian broadcaster. Which when you think back, it's a bit crazy to let a 20 year old go and commentate to I think it was 14 different countries at the time, uh, which is a bit mad. But so I had done a lot of commentary out in Asia, um, uh, in that part of the, in, you know, for Star out in India and Asia, but also with B in sports in the Middle East. And then I did Five Live, um, 
you know, Sky is the fifth different broadcaster work with. I did stuff with F1 for, uh, they had this thing called F1 in cinemas, which I don't know whoever actually went to see it in the cinemas, but uh, Ben Edwards and I did the commentary oh, for it uh, for a couple of years, which was when I was doing GP2. But I, all of it, truthfully, I started doing because I needed to earn an income. You know, I, I had just about enough commercial sponsorship to cover the racing, not ever with a top team and all the rest of it, but it was enough to, to keep going. But you still had to live. So I worked at the Silverson Race School. Um, you know, I drove the recovery vehicle on bike track days. So when the bikes would fall off, I'd drive the van up and the guy would be lying there with a broken leg going, oh, my bike. It's like, where's the ambulance? Here you go, put you in there. All right, what garage are you in? Number five, chuck the bike in, drop it off, go park at the end of the pit lane again. So I did that for a couple of years uh, and then started doing the commentary as a just way to earn an income, really. And then it developed into that. And actually, I, got, I, I, I took a bit of inspiration from David Coulthard because um, he, you know, when he stopped his driving career, he, he knew instantly that he was going to start a television career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he already had it planned in his head. Whereas Martin, I think, sort of, Martin still, if you put him on the grid, if you said there's a seat going in Bahrain, he would be there. Yeah. Like he's never, the racing driver's never stopped in him. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think, so yeah, for me, there was a TV career as, as, a, uh -huh. as, an, as an option for the future. And you, you call it commentating, but I think we look on more you as, as the, technical, the technical guru, or do you see there's really the same, the same thing? I think, I think um, you know, Anthony Davidson and I sort of share this role as, as, as ex expert analysts. You know, we try and <laughs> offer another layer on, on top of, um, the commentary and analyze things. You know, we have the great tool with the SkyPad and things like that. And yeah. you know, it's, quite it's, often it's quite good because the drivers, when they come to talk to us, this was Charles when he got pole in, in Monza. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've not seen their laps at this stage. They've got out of the car. They've done the interview that you guys see with Park Ferme. They go um, straight to the media interviews uh, or the press conference if you're on pole and then come straight here. So at this point, this is normally the first time they've even seen their lap, and we often mm -hmm. show them side by side versus one of their competitors. Yeah. So they actually get quite into it because they themselves feel like they haven't seen something or won't learn something. And we, we, on TV, you don't obviously see all the people around it, but yeah. is, is it always sort of as manic as that? There's always lots of people well, all crowded Italy, around? So oh, okay. there's a bit more madness okay. um, in like everything. And uh, an another one with, uh, with, with Charles? Yeah, that was Miami, I think. No, I think, you know, as I say, it's, it's, um, it's fascinating, right? Because uh, the, the margins nowadays, you compare, you compare F1 to today versus 20 years ago, it is so tight. You know, 1, 1 1.1, 1 1.2 seconds covers 20 cars in Q1. And you go back, well, I was talking about that Mansell video, that was an extreme, but you, you know, even in the 80s, 1.1 seconds would generally cover the top six, maybe, top five, top six. Mm -hmm. So it is so, so close at the moment. Um, and the drivers are just having to look for these marginal gains. The tires are not notoriously temperamental, more, more than anything we've ever had. And so, you know, they're driving around with the tire temperatures on their dashboard, and, and they have to get the tire preparation absolutely right, you know, two, three degrees off on tire prep, and the lap's gone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's amazing the level that the drivers have to operate at nowadays. Mm -hmm. So a driver like Leclerc, who's traditionally very fast in qualifying, he must have an extra skill level in just, just get, get, get it, getting the car set up perfectly for his, his qualifying lap. I, I do think over one lap, he is the best qualifier on the grid at the moment. I, you know, he's got this this feel, it, 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 that's the same in any era, right? That's the same as whichever era of the sport. You've got to, it's, it's about having balance and feel and, you know, motor racing and, and qualifying in particular is about standing on the precipice, keeping the car balanced on the precipice and not falling off it. And who's the one who's bravest in, in terms of being able to hang off the edge and bring it back um, and, and deliver the lap? And I think Leclerc is one of the extraordinary talents of that. So yeah, so we think back to the old days of J James Hunt and Murray Walker. It's, um, it's a bit bit different now with the uh, the size of the, uh, the the Sky Team. Mind you, everybody doesn't go to every race, obviously, as you yep. say. You 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 share it out, but it's a yeah. it's a heck of a team. Yeah, and listen, we're lucky, right? We we're, we're genuinely friends. Um, we go for dinners together. I mean, I was out. Anthony and I were out 
with our kids at the go-kart track earlier today. I've just come from Wilton Mill. You know, we were out there with our kids and, the, and our wives. And, you know, we're, I had dinner with Simon two days ago. And, you know, we're, we're genuinely friends away from the track. Um, and hopefully that translates. It, it, it does. So ch changing the subject um, completely, you're, uh, you're a director of uh, Motorsport UK. For my sins. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your, your role there and uh, what, what, what you do? I think it's... Um, it's a bit like voting in an election, in the sense you can either sit there and grumble about all the things wrong in the country and then not do anything about it, or you can try and get in the system and try and do something. So I joined the FIA's Drivers Commission back in 2013, which is um, essentially, you know, we represent the rights and views of drivers. What I've come to learn over the last 11 years of being there is that in the end, the FIA is like government. And you can come up with all these ideas and all these solutions on track limits and driving standards and driving etiquette and overtaking rules and all this stuff, which really you would have thought a driver's commission would be well placed to, to come up with ideas on, but they get ignored. Mm -hmm. um, so then I got asked by um, Hugh Chambers, the CEO of Mosby UK, and David Richards, the, the chairman, um, whether I join the board. And um, the before I joined the board, I, I did a project with them around F Formula 4 in the UK. Uh, Formula 4 in the UK, it, it was dying. It was down to eight or nine cars. And they, Hugh basically said, look, tell us what you think. Go off and just have a look and think uh, how we can we're losing. We're losing to the Italian Championship, the German, the Spanish Championship. And that's bad because in the past, the UK was the epicenter of European mm. sport and what's yeah. going wrong. So anyway, we, long story short, we did the same, came up with some ideas and completely re revamped the championship, took it over in-house. Uh, and we're now gone, we're back to full grids. We're up to 24 cars at the last race of last year and it's, it's gone well. And, and I sort of came out of that thinking, this is an interesting exercise because it's an organization where I feel like I'm being heard and mm -hmm. I can affect mm -hmm. change and I can do things um, where people are listening. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, David and Hugh as a combination are fantastic to work with. You know, D David, for, I think we all know his story of ProDrive and rallying and things like that, but um, he's an amazing asset to, mm -hmm. this, to this country in terms of motorsport, really. And I think uh, we'll struggle to replace him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his, his tenure as chairman will come up at some point and I think we'll it's very tough to find a, a replacement. You know, he, he gets, he uses his personal time. It's, you know, we're all volunteers, right? We don't get paid to be directors of this. Um, David will use his personal weekends. He's an incredibly busy man, but he will go to club events and hill climbs and, really? you know, mm -hmm. streetcar events and just to have a look at how things are going. And um, yeah, and I think, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to run it less like a governmental body uh, and more like a professional organization, which, which pushes change and like a race team or a rally team. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, yeah, very commendable after everything you've done. You're uh, volunteering and putting something uh, back into the sport and uh, getting the, the benefit of your experience. Well, uh, Karun, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Karun Chanthuk. So um, we, we have Lorraine here with the uh, roving mic. Does anybody have any questions? One right behind you there, Lorraine, just right there behind you for, uh, for, for, for Karun. Hello, Karun. Thank you so much for some great stories. You're a great student of the history of the sport, which we really appreciate in your commentaries. You mentioned Jimmy being your number one driver. I just wondered who you would say was the most exciting driver in Formula One across the history. I'll give you a clue who I think, uh, Mad Ronald. Ron, Ronnie Peterson was probably my favourite, but I just wonder who you thought might be the most exciting rather than the, the best driver. I think it's got to be. I think it's Senna. You know, you, uh, I even now, I go down these sort of YouTube rabbit holes uh, <laughs> of watching his qualifying laps. It's just devastating. De you know, it's just devastating to you just watch the the commitment, the absolute commitment with which he drove. Um, and, and I think, you know, Lewis in terms of 
um, the modern era, I think Lewis is maybe not as of not now because he's, he's a bit different from when he arrived, but you think of when Lewis arrived, 2007, 8, 9, there was, something was always going to happen. He was never just going to drive around in second place. Um, Fernando's the same. You know, there's just, there's an energy about the way they go racing. Um, you know, given the fact Fernando's 41 now, it's amazing to have that motivation this much. But, yeah, for me, the short answer is, you know, Senna is just amazing to a watch. And it's quite dark. And I, I'd there. say that as a, someone who wasn't a Senna fan growing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another, another question just over, over here. Yeah. Um, you tweeted the other day that you were with McLaren and Mercedes at Silverstone. There's some exciting things coming in Bahrain. Yesterday, Can you yeah. elaborate at all on that? Or? It's that fa I love this phase of the season, right? Because everyone has a, there's a buoyancy about their body language and how they feel. But I think in any rule cycle, you'll start to see convergence. Um, you know, and I think McLaren, what they did last year was amazing. The, the, mm -hmm. It's very rare these days with the tight regulations and the cost cap and the, the wind tunnel rules and things like that to see a mid-season turnaround. Um, I, I was really pleased to see what McLaren did in starting in Austria with Lando and then from Silverstone onwards with both cars. Because um, we want to see McLaren competitive. I think, you know, it's a good story, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think uh, we want to see Williams competitive. We want to see McLaren competitive. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lando's a great character, but I, I, I have um, really high hopes for Oscar. I, I remember watching him in F2 and talking to Mark, where was a, a, a friend. And I remember standing, I can't remember what race was. We were in the motor and watching and in F2, and he was unbelievable. He was uh, head and shoulders above anybody else. And you could see there was um, something special there. So he, he struggled a bit in the races last year. So I'll be interested to see if he can develop on that. Um, but Mercedes is a massive year. You know, I think their star driver has given them a little bit of a vote of no confidence by saying he's off to their biggest rivals. Um, and so there's a bit of they want to, I'm sure, try and prove him wrong for the decision he's made. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a big year, you know, because... Ultimately, and this is, I come back to it, the people running the teams, Toto's the only one today who, I think I'm right in saying, he's the only one who is an owner of the team, who's at the active team principal. The, other, the rest of them are all em employees, is a, is a throwaway word, but effectively they're, they're, they don't own a part of it. And, you know, so Toto's got skin in the game and he's deeply, deeply hates losing. Um, so, you know, I'm interested to see what they can do. About the future on Andretti, are we going to see uh, Mario's son over here? It doesn't look like it's going to happen. Um, it looks like the other teams have put the pressure on, on F1 and F... Yeah, I, I, honestly, I don't fully understand it. Um, sorry, let me rephrase. I fully understand why the teams don't want Andretti to come in, right? It's... it's it's not rocket science. A five-year-old can work out a slice of pie divided up 11 ways instead of 10 is less for each one. So that's not rocket science. But there must have been a way to create a compensation which would have benefited those teams. Uh, and, and like like a, growing the sport in America, for example, and, and for, yeah, for see, the benefit look, of everybody. Yeah, all that stuff is just hard to prove. I, I think fundamentally having more cars on the grid is good for the sport. Mm -hmm. It's good for young. It's bad that a young kid like Oscar, who was... His junior Formula CV was impeccable, had to sit out a year and couldn't go from F2 to F1 because there wasn't a seat. The last two F2 champions aren't graduating to F1. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a problem there. So I think f as a driver, first of all, I'd like to see more cars on the grid. Secondly, um, I think, yeah, they would have come in and they've probably not been competitive. But people like Minardi for many years, there's an underdog story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's, I think that you give them time and over time with the way the rules are nowadays with listed parts and things, maybe they could have done something. But yeah, fundamentally, I don't understand why F1 weren't pushing for it. There's, there's something, something in a bigger picture which I think will only come out when we get the news of the next Concord Agreement. But basically they're done because what's happening, you kick the can down the road, when you go to the next Concord Agreement coming in for 26, it'll be locked at 10 franchises. This was the window because 
the teams were all peddling the story that it's 10 franchises and we all own a franchise. That's false. There, there isn't a franchise system in Formula One today. There might be in the future, but by the law, there are 12 slots on the FI Formula One World Championship entry list, and only 10 have been taken. So you could flip the argument around and say, the, team, the 10 teams have benefited from having 10 slices of the pie instead of it being divided 12 ways, which is what the law actually allowed. And that's the argument between the FIA and F1 at the moment. Um, but the way it's played out, it's too late for Andretti to come in, would have been too late for 25, and they'd be blocked. Um, obviously, you've driven a, f a fabulous selection of cars. I wondered what you, was your favorite, and was there, is there anything you'd like to drive? Uh, if Lorraine grabs my phone, which is on there, you'll see the screensaver. If you just click the side button, you'll see it. Hopefully, it's, there you go. That's the car that you've all seen in the video, which is the FW14B, so it's not a picture of my kids, uh, which <laughs> you could judge me for that <laughs> separately. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as I, um, I say, the most awe-inspiring experience was the 2004 Montoya Williams. Uh, just an amazing car, as a pure driving experience. Um, as an um, emotional experience, driving that Red 5 was it. I think there are two cars which I would absolutely love, love to drive. Um, the 1990 Ferrari 641, uh, the Prost Mansell car. Uh, and the MP44 McLaren of 1988. Just as a, a question, Karun, um, we've seen some pretty good drivers. Danny Rick couldn't get on with the McLaren, mm. and um, Checo has struggled last year with the, uh, the, the Red Bull. Um, Fernando seems to be able to drive anything, anywhere, at any time. Uh, why is that that uh, you know, a driver struggles with a particular car? I think Daniel's struggles at McLaren are one of the biggest mysteries of modern F1. I, I don't think anyone has an answer. They went round and round for two years trying to get an answer, and he just couldn't get one. It, it, you know, he often talked about, I can't drive on corner entry of medium to slow speed corners the way I like, but he could never find a solution for it. Um, it's a bit like Sebastian Vettel's last two years of Ferrari but he just all of a sudden seemed to be spinning a lot and nobody could understand just where it had gone. You know, Leclerc came in basically as a rookie and destroyed him. Uh, so, you know, it's just one of those mysteries with talent doesn't disappear, but for whatever reason, it's just, they, it just went away. It's a big year for Daniel because if he, you know, he had a good race at Mexico towards the end of last year, a uh, very strong qualifying, very strong race. Um, but actually, across the runner races he had, he didn't actually beat Yuki Sonoda or out-qualify. He was out-qualified by Sonoda 4-3. So, you know, if you're taking a claim to be in, a, in the big team alongside Max, they, you'd want to see someone who's going to be hammering Sonoda every week. So I think it's a big... I think you have to give Daniel the benefit of the doubt that he had the broken hand that put him out and disrupted the season, obviously. So we'll see. But I think... To me, the great drivers, and Fernando is a great example of that, because he, um, so much of, a, of the cues that a drivers get comes from the tire. And I think if I rewind the clock, you look on, online, you see some videos of Fernando driving um, the Renault with the Michelin tires, 2005-06. He had this bizarre driving style where he just sort of turned the steering wheel in a, in a very unorthodox way. But he made it work, he won two world championships. And then he went to McLaren in 2007, completely different, you know, single spec Bridgestone tire, and was a title contender, lost the title by one point uh, at the end. And, you know, that to me just shows the driver's adaptability. And I think, you know, Fernando, he's gone to sports cars. At, at Le Mans, the Toyota drivers, I remember talking, when, they, when he did the testing, they thought, mm, he's, he's there, but he's not, you know, uh, they, they were trying to see what this special magic was. And then when he got in it at night, in the night stint, that's when the sort of real Fernando came out and he was just a cut above. I, I thought he was fantastic at Indianapolis as well. I mean, well, he was yeah, re really rookie, competitive there. He, yeah. he was running the top five, wasn't he? And a chance you know, of winning it as well, yeah. Yeah. So I think there's, yeah, but to, uh, the Daniel question, honestly, I think even 
when he writes his book in 40 years time, he'll have no answer. <laughs> uh, hi, Karun. Um, hi. I've got quite a geeky and quite a cheeky question. Oh, um, God. Have I'll you try. Read, let's see. Have you read Jackie Stewart's autobiography, Winning? Uh, winning is not enough. Winning is not enough. That's the one. Exactly, that's the one. Yeah. I haven't, no. I've read his okay. other one called Faster. Okay, well, here comes the, the geeky question then. There's a bit in there where he's talking about his development as a driver. And he says at the start of his career, he thought there were three phases to a corner. I guess entry, middle, and exit. At the end of his career, he said there were nine. And then doesn't tell us what the heck they are. <laughs> okay, number well, one. I can only do, imagine do you have three by three divided are? them into uh, yeah. more detailed phases of it. You know, there's a... With every, with every phase as you load the car up and, and go from there. Because obviously, you know, when Jackie finished in 73, it was starting to get into the wing era, weren't we? So the cars, I imagine, were, were changing quite a lot. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have the answer apart from having to ask him. <laughs> the gentleman here has been, I wanted to ask you a question. Lauren, thank you. Karun, thank you for a really fascinating talk. Um, just a technical question, really. Do you think, it, is it the weight of the cars that's adding criticality to the temp tire temperature? Is that where that problem is coming from, basically? I think, I think the tires, the tires inherently aren't as robust, shall we say, as what we had before with Bridgestone and, and Michelin. You could argue they were asked to produce tires that degraded and created better racing. But we've ended up in the situation where we have, there's a, there's a difference between what we call thermal degradation, which is basically overheating, and actual tire wear and degradation. And the big issue we've had with Pirelli's for many years is thermal. So they, they just overheat. And the drivers, you know, they come out of a corner and they're terrified to, to put the throttle down and get a bit of wheel spin because they just see a spike in temperature and then it takes two, three laps to bring that back down. Um, whereas in the past, you know, you could, you could control that in a better way. So I think that's, so that's why we've ended up these races where they're driving around nine, eight, nine, ten seconds off the pace, um, just managing tires. So I'll give you an example, right? Max Verstappen at Barcelona last year, droning around, 17-3, 17-1, 17-4, 17-3, droning around, 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 and then decides one lap he's going to have a go. And I appreciate you've got the hybrid systems and the batteries now so you can, you can dump a whole lot of power and lap time. But he just decided to hit the tires for a lap and did a 16.1 or 16.2 or something. Just unleashed a second of lap time because he wanted to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's... But listen, if you go rewind the clock, they had to manage fuel in the turbo era. You know, they were, when they came down to the 190, 195 liters, whatever, the mid-80s. So there's always a degree of management. But I think the, the type of management now, because there's so much information uh, available to the drivers, has created this slightly frustrating feeling in the cockpit of the drivers. Um, in many Because as soon as you start to go a bit quicker, they've got all this data, right? They've got carcass temperature, inner shoulder, outer. They've got all the temperatures. And you've got the engineer shouting at you to slow down. <laughs> Uh, which you, you probably didn't have, you know, going back. Right. So we'll have one fi final question d d down here. Yeah, no, no pressure. Uh, it's more for the community, I think. Um, you've had an amazing, or you're, you're privileged to drive an amazing range of cars. And for us weekend warriors, you must have a process that you go through when you first jump in that car to try and find its limits, find the speed. Um, and, and carry that speed for the rest of the weekend. And I wonder if you could share some of your process of how you, you learn that car's limits. I think it's, it's, about, it's about just trying to relax into it, not trying to force the issue. Uh, you know, anytime you, you sort of think, I've got to go out of the pits and I've, got, I've only got half an hour or 45 minutes, I've got to get on with it and learn as quickly as possible and get on the lap time. It's very easy to overdrive and to, to sort of go into this, this, this circle of trying too hard. I think it is, I always think it's, it's important to, to just understand the beast you're in, you know, understand how the car reacts when you, with every steering input, when, when, you, when you brake, when you get on throttle, what, 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 how does it respond? Um, an experiment, you know, you don't, you don't need to put 
the whole lap together until you get to qualifying. So spend your time when you first get going just trying to understand different lines. How does it react off a curb? How, what happens if you try a slightly different angle on the entry to a corner? Just, you know, bide your, bide your time and sort of ease your way into it. Um, so then you, you've created this mental picture in your own head of what works and what doesn't. So when you get to when it matters and qualifying in the race, you can you can put the pieces of the puzzle together. But I think any time you try and go out there and just try and force a lap time, it, it very rarely comes through. Over dinner, we were talking about the uh, the history of Brooklands, and uh, I've got a little gift for you, uh, Corinne, for you to take to take with you, and hopefully it's something you're going to treasure because this is a 1907 piece of concrete. Oh wow, that's this amazing. Is a, this. <laughs> It looks very clean. It's very clean, yeah. yeah. Th this is a small piece of concrete from the, the original Brooklyn's track as built in 1907. Oh, so thank on behalf you very of Brooklyn's, much. I'd like to nice. give you that little gift. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay, um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and um, without any... Your wife's waving at you. Yeah, uh, I was about to say, without being reminded, um, and having, for the first time in my life, remembered, uh, we actually have a raffle now. So uh, the raffle...